Hey, what's happening, everybody? This is Snake Sable from Skid Row, and you are listening to Appetite for Distortion with my brother, Brando. Thank you. And I also realized I've been saying your last name wrong my entire life. I don't know why I said Sal. That's okay. <laughs> Most people do. Actually, to be honest with you, my name is it should be S-Z-A-B-O and should be pronounced Jabo. Uh, that's the way it's pronounced in, in Hungary. What happened was when my uh, great-grandparents or grandparents came over, I'm not quite sure which because my father was orphaned. When they came over, they dropped the Z at Ellis Island as they did with so many immigrants. They changed the spelling of the last name to make it easier to pronounce. Oh, okay. Fascinating. I, I respect yep. that. As, as a Weisler, who knows what my last name was before uh, Ellis Island. Do you mind yeah. if I include that little piece in my uh, episode? The not little at all. Family fact? All right, cool. I will. I know where they are. Distortion. Welcome to the podcast, Appetite for Distortion, episode number 381. My oh, wow. name is, yeah, 381. Congratulations, man. Thank you very much. I should have looked up to see what episode Rachel Boland was. It wasn't that long ago, but he's, I mean, it took a while. I wanted to get you guys on. I think I wanted to I mean, keep going until I get the uh, all the current skid row on the uh, on the podcast. Oh, that's cool, dude. Well, thanks for wanting us on and wanting to talk to us. It's awesome. I, I really appreciate it. I will say uh, a little behind the curtain. I was looking for my skid row shirt. I got it from like Hot Topic like 20 years ago. <laughs> Couldn't find it. Couldn't find it. But since you're a Jersey guy, I got Jersey Jack pinball shirt. That place is awesome. I was lucky enough to I didn't go to the Jersey location. I went to the Chicago location. I'm already going off on a tangent. Uh, my wife is from there and I got to visit the location where they, you know, they make the meat in the guts, so to speak, of, the, of all the pinball machines. And that's pretty cool. That's very cool. By the way, do you have one in your house? I always said if I was like a big rock star, I would have like pinball machines like Slash. I don't, but I love pinball, and I've been a. I played as a kid, and then we used to go to this bar right down the street from my mom's house, and uh, a place called Simcoe's, and and we would have, we would be just crazy lunatics playing the Gorgon machine, uh, you know, with about a hundred beers in our gut. So it was a lot of good memories. Right on. Because I, I bonded a little bit with this with Rachel off the bat because we're East Coast guys. I'm not – there is a difference, New Jersey, New York. I mean I have listeners everywhere. They may – like what's the difference? You're all like mafia <laughs> people. No, there's – there is I know there's a big difference. Um, first thing I got to ask, Jets, Giants, or you don't care? Oh, I care. Okay. Oh, Jets. Okay. All right. Giants. Damn it. All right. I'm not going to put on my Giants hat then. All right. Maybe we won't be best friends, but it's it's okay. I'm rooting for you guys. You, you got to see a victory in since 1969. Um, oh, it's the worst. It's so <laughs> bad, man. I mean, look, I take every bit of criticism because they deserve it. They've had nothing but failure after failure. Uh, you know, front office disasters, coaching disasters, I mean, we're still living down the Rich Cotite era. You know, it's just one in 14 at that particular time, I think it was. And, uh, you know, so every every bit of, of uh, bad uh, karma you want to throw our way, it won't, it won't hurt us because we already have enough of it. It makes you, and which I guess love, are you bitter? Because they, I'm sorry, I don't know why I'm getting off on a sports tangent right away. Because they're, they play in Jersey. They play MetLife or the Giants Stadium. You know, but they're in New York. I mean, are you offended as a New Jersey guy? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I would be too. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And the Giants should be as well. At least the Giants had the stadium named after them, you know? You're right. Talk about being a second-class citizen. <laughs> you're, you're a football team in the AFC, and you're playing in the NFC stadium. It's like, really? And I look at these other stadiums around the, the country, whether it's in Dallas or Las Vegas or Los Angeles, and – they're just these amazing stadiums. 
and then we come up with MetLife. Are you kidding me? It it's is a under, joke. It is underwhelming, and I do have a point. I always do, even though it takes me a while to get there. Because for the most part, growing up in New, uh, New York, either Long Island or Brooklyn or whatever, Queens now, uh, the only time I would really go to Jersey would be to see go to see concerts. A lot have been in MetLife. I even said to my wife, because we maybe we'll take out a second mortgage, mortgage and try to get my Metallica tickets. We'll see. <laughs> But um, I guess the curious thing is because you just announced dates for, with Buck Cherry, but it's all in the middle of the country. So where's the East Coast love? Where's the West Coast oh, love? Oh, it's coming. It's absolutely okay. coming. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, my gosh. Of course. We're going to be touring throughout the, the whole year. We have uh, Europe and, and South America, Australia, Japan, Southeast Asia. Oh, wow. Uh, and, and then another run in the U.S. as well. And so, yeah, we're, of course. Okay. We're, 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 we're just, we were talking about that today with our management. So, yeah. Well, how about you? How are you feeling? I guess, if you don't mind me asking, because I know you had to cancel some dates for this year. So that's why we're looking forward to, to next year already. How are you? Yeah. Doing? I mean, we we had to cancel or we actually didn't even cancel. We postponed four Australia shows. Um, I had to go get neck surgery on Tuesday and uh, they're doing disc replacement surgery. I have got these, really bad degenerative discs in my neck. And it causes uh, nerve issues down both my arms, but predominantly my left arm to the point where uh, mostly every show, my arm will freeze up. Um, whether it's the way the guitar sits on my shoulders, whether it's the way we move around on stage, whatever the case may be. Uh, this has been something that's been going on for quite some time, nearly two decades and uh, actually two decades. And uh uh, it just got to the point where it it's it's so it's been chronic, but it it's just got to the point where it has to be addressed. And you know, cortisone shots don't work. I don't want to get the vertebrae vertebrae fused because I don't want to uh, reduce my mobility in any way or hinder my mobility. So um, this surgery was presented to me, and I wanted to do it at a time where uh, you know where people were not really booking shows and holidays and things like that. And then my doctor said to me, uh, you know, we're, we're, we need to do this, you know, and, and I suggest that, you know, when you're done with your touring in November, that uh, we have a lot of pre-op stuff that we have to do. And, and um, it'd be best if you were just home. And so uh, obviously I spoke with the guys and, and, uh, we, and we spoke with our management and the and the promoter down in Australia and said, due to this, uh, you know, this injury that I have, is it okay if we postpone till next year? So it looks like we're going back in May. Um, and then I'll coincide with a Japanese run and uh, hopefully Southeast Asia as well. So it worked out and I'm, I'm looking forward to it. And uh uh, I'm, you know, oddly enough, I'm not nervous about it. I'm just looking forward to getting it done and, and moving on. And hopefully, you know, uh, it won't uh, inhibit my my playing ability any more than I already do. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you're being modest. Well, I appreciate you talking about that because something that it gives me an opportunity for me to talk about. I have a degenerative uh, nerve condition. I've had it kind of since I was 10. It's It's oh, interesting. Man. Yeah, it, it's interesting because it uh, was a mutation, what, not in my family or anything like that. So over time, it's uh, there's something missing in the nerves where the message doesn't really get there from the brain. Oh, wow. So it just makes things weaker. It's called demyelinating peripheral neuropathy. Say that oh, wow. five times. It's like MS, but for the nerves. Okay. No, no pain or anything like that. But as you were speaking, sometimes if I'm, I don't know, because I work radio boards. That's kind of, you know, that's my job. This podcast is just a, a side hobby within my radio career. There are times I'm like I gotta stop, stretch my arms, I get little maybe uh, pins and needles in my my hands. It's mainly in my legs, so I walk, walk with uh, leg braces and a, and a cane. I have a Skid Row sticker on my with my leg brace. I should have. I should have shown you that. Terrible though, dude. I'm really sorry to hear that. No, it's I'm okay. I'm 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 married. I'm living. Um, I'm, I I mean, I just got married. I'm gonna have a kid on the way. I'm talking to a snake from Skid Row. So exciting stuff. Thank you. It's, but it gives me an opportunity, and I think fans an opportunity, because not everyone talks about that. They think sometimes rock stars are superheroes, or you know, why are you taking off, or why is this happening? And so, right. like with Mick, it makes me think of Mick Mars, someone like that. So, uh, 
you've been dealing with a lot for a long time. For, that dude's for a warrior, man. That dude is a warrior. I, I, you know, I mean, he's just, you never heard a peep out of him. He just went about his business and did his thing to, you know, in, in a great way. I mean, you know, there is no Motley Crue uh, throughout history without McMars. And so, you know, I love the guy and, and uh, sad that he's retiring, but I get it, of course. Was that it? Did it even cross your mind? Because it sounds like this is going to have a pro, uh, a positive impact with the you're already since you're already planning dates and already thinking about next year. But it was like, I don't know if I could do this. You know, did that cross it's, your mind? Uh, it, it, retiring or anything like that. No, no, not at all. I mean, that is the running joke in my family that, you know, that there's, I will never retire. I, it's just not in my vernacular. And so, I, uh, but it, it's, it's frustrating because it, it pretty much every night I, I, I have to deal with my arm kind of freezing up. And so I, I have to map out a plan of, of when that happens, what I have to do to unhinge it, if you will. Sure. I mean, I, uh, I get it. Yeah. And so, uh, yeah, it, it's problematic. And sometimes it's kind of embarrassing because you're in the middle of playing and then all of a sudden your arm freezes and you can't really move it. And so you have to uh, be creative in, in how you uh, kind of uh, tiptoe around it and, and hope that it doesn't uh, affect the song and affect the performance of the band in any way. But, you know, now's the right time to do it. And, and I, uh, uh, I'm really confident in in people that are are going to be performing this and and uh, and in the process and and you know I'll be in and out and enjoying the holidays. Cool, cool. And I call it whenever I find like a different way to do something. I'm like MacGyvering it. I'm just finding, ah, figuring, figuring that's out really my way. What it is though, you're right? absolutely right. Uh, that's exactly what it is. Like I've got to hit these nerve endings, these pressure points to kind of loosen everything up. And then I have to take a bunch of salt and, but it's, it's, it's finding that time within the set without disrupting the flow of the show and making it really obvious what's going on. And the whole idea is to make so that people don't know. And so, you know, there's just certain things that I have to do in order to, to, uh, you know, hi, uh, not allow people to realize that there's something that might be going on. Sure. And I mean, I've just learned, I mean, I don't need to tell you, you're older than me, if you don't mind me saying, but sometimes with the embarrassment, like you just gotta be like, you know what? I'm not embarrassed. This is, it is what it is. If someone looks at me differently, that's on them. You know, that's absolutely. That's, yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know, I'm to me, this is, this is a, a not that, it, that, that it's easy, but it's just a process. And, sure. And, I'll get through it and, and, you know, life will be better. Right on. And to, to pivot a little bit, I'm glad you got the MacGyver reference. I'm, I'm younger than <laughs> you, but I'm not as young as Eric Gronwall. So I'm curious. <laughs> it seems like you guys are having fun on, on tour, but I'm just, it just how my brain works. Uh, did it ever happen? Maybe you're joking with the rest of the band and he just doesn't get it. You're talking like about Mr. Cotter or something. Well, you know, you know it, what? It, yes and no. Okay. Yeah, he's an old soul. Okay. Uh, that's one of the things that I find very endearing about him is that, you know, he's got kind of a lot of the same influences uh, as we do. Um, and, you know, his, his father taught him really, really well and, and exposed him to a lot of great pop culture growing up. And so he's familiar with a lot of the stuff uh, that we are. So I don't know if he'd be familiar with Mr. Cotter, but, <laughs> uh, but he's familiar. You know, again, you got to remember that he's from Stockholm, Sweden. That's another. So that's, uh, sure. you know, I mean, who knows what, what their Mr. Cotter was. You know? <laughs> I don't even want to insult the country by trying to do an accent and you know and, and yeah right exactly me too gabe kaplan swedish accents just just yeah i don't it. know if that would fly so well but. <laughs> but it's uh with that i asked this like a, like a silly question because this band right now seems to have such a positive vibe around it and and fans are really excited uh so i guess with that it's very cool that you're now you're pairing up with buck cherry so and who i'm lucky enough to have had josh todd on the program before 
How did this tour uh, come together? How did it? And, and we've known each other know? for okay. decades, and we've toured together before in Europe. And so when we we're when we were just checking out options of of what sort of packages we could put together, uh, their name was one of the first names that came up, and 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 so we immediately reached out to them and and said, "How do you guys feel about?" you know, joining forces and going out and doing a bunch of dates in the States. And those guys tour like crazy. Yeah. And so being that we had toured together in the past and we all get along really, really well, and there's a mutual respect there. It kind of was really easy. Uh, there was no big back and forth between agents and management and stuff like that. It was really easy. And so that's why, uh, you know, we have no doubt that the shows themselves will be great. Um, both bands are high energy and excuse me, there's a lot of great songs there to be heard. They have gonna a, be, a great catalog. They do. And so we uh we're like I said, we're making plans for to go continue this, you know, more legs in in the rest of the year. Since it's it's cause it's co headlining, right? Are you gonna be yeah. flipping? You know, one you go one night and then they close another night. That... I don't think we're flipping, but it it is a it is a co-headline. We'll have the same amount of time on stage. Oh, okay, yeah, that's cool. Right on. Uh, what is there a part of the country or city that you're looking forward to hitting other than Australia and making up those dates? But is there a place that you're really looking forward to going back to? Looking forward to going back to Japan. Uh, you know, this record has reopened so many doors for us it's really it, it's it's really something and it's it's also very humbling and and uh you know we're all kind of taken aback by the not only the response that we've gotten from you know the uh, the audience but uh just the way it, uh, people have responded around the world and and you know the the record debuted in the top 20 in like 10 or 11 countries. And, uh, and we found out a couple of weeks ago that, you know, in Japan, it, in the, in the rock charts, it was number one and ahead of bands, uh, metal and rock bands that we love that, you know, and, and it's just really something because this hasn't happened in 27 years. So the fact that we're, we've been given this gift of being able to, not only you know work with such a great great producer like Nick Raskilinitz, who all the credit in the world goes to him for pulling this together, because without him this record doesn't exist, and that's a fact, man. Uh, he had so much to do with it. Uh, he really is the quintessential producer, you know, um, and him and getting Eric in the band that just brought this this life and this lust for life and this appreciation for the moment and this positivity, but yet this humility and gratitude, uh, it's infectious. And we've all always felt that way. And maybe that's why, you know, Rachel Scotty and I have been able to persevere uh, within Skid Row for so long. It's just that we always viewed everything as a gift there, you know, life doesn't owe you anything. And, uh, it's, you know, success is not a birthright. It's an absolute gift and it should be treated as such. And, 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 and we've always been humbled by that. Thanks to our upbringing, uh, our, you know, all raised in lower middle class families, hard workers, blue collar. Uh, but we are always taught to appreciate, you know, what we're given in life and, and what we earn in life. And, but it's not always going to be like that. So be prepared and, and just be thankful of your experiences and persevere. And that's what we've been able to do. And so, you know, 36, 37 years later, we're still best friends and we're still, you know, uh, able to go out and play music for a living, which is an unbelievable gift. Mm. Uh, it, it really is. And I think uh, you said the word I was looking for, which is an easy word, uh, but excitement. There's an excitement around the band that hasn't been around and it, almost in maybe in my lifetime, because as you, I'm sure you could tell with Appetite for Distortion, the the theme of it, Guns N' Roses. So I, yeah. So with my, I mean, I became a fan when they were already broken up. I think you oh, were. Wow. Okay. So, or it, I was the Chinese democracy era. So, I mean, it's just interesting, but I, I'm somebody who goes back. Yeah, let's go back. 
I'm kind of like Eric a little bit. My my dad taught me well. You know, uh, see, I make the Mister uh, Cotter references, but it wasn't on the air when I was alive. I watched reruns. Right, was, right, right, right. Exactly. So it, to reminisce, to go back a little bit, because I want to. I know we're talking about the present, which we're excited about. But while I got you here, if we could talk about, because um, you mentioned Nick. It has my brains going. You're the producer, and I believe you worked with Slash and and Matt Sorum before uh, with Guns with a uh, Velvet Revolver. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. So that's that's kind of exciting. Well, um, he's his resume is impeccable. I mean, everybody from uh, the Foo Fighters to Hailstorm to Rush, Alice in Chains, Mastodon, uh, Stone Sour, uh, you know, Velvet Revolver, um, and I, I'm sure I'm missing a ton. But he's not only a great producer, he's very prolific and, and accomplished songwriter, or musician, uh, and just, but most importantly, he's just a great guy. Uh, he's just a great guy and figured out a way, as he put it, you know, kind of reintroduce us to ourselves. Mm. <laughs> And his goal was to make a quintessential Skid Row record, which he did. And he had a very uh, concise and uh, well thought out game plan of how to accomplish that. And he explained to us, he was just like, you know, I know your music. I'm a fan of your music. I've seen you play a bunch of times. You know, he's a Jersey boy. And uh, he's like, you know, through the years, as happens, the more records you make, the further you get away from the person who uh, wrote those, put this band together, the people that put this band together, the people that wrote those songs, the inspiration behind wanting to do this in the first place. And so when he started talking like that, it made sense to me because, you know, at the end of the day, I've said this countless times, but I need to be reminded of it. Um, I'm, I'm still that 16 year old kid at my mom's house in my bedroom with an Ibanez Iceman strapped on my shoulder, pretending I'm Paul Stanley or Ace Frehley or, you know, Iron Maiden or you know, Black Sabbath or whomever, or Eddie Van Halen, Randy Rhodes. And that spirit and that fire never dissipates. It's always there. And it's kind of like, you know, the, the onion thing where, you know, life adds layers, but mm. if you peel that away, that is still burning. And once that window to that uh, fire opened up again, it, it, it made perfect sense. Uh, uh, we relinquished ourselves to Nick because his idea was he wanted to deconstruct and rebuild every song. And so, uh, you have to have immense trust in a person in order to allow them to do that to your creations. And we did. We, we, we all agreed. Let's just, what have we got to lose? But in mm -hmm. doing so, you know, you have to, uh, you have to lay, lay, leave your ego in the parking lot. Um, yeah. That's just the way that it is. And, and in order to allow this process to occur. And so we did, and we were wide open. We're like, man, we're all yours. Just guide us along the way. Well, the Gangs Hall here is a great record. I mean, like he, it, it shows. Like it definitely shows. Like his resume shows, and this is just another one on his his resume. Uh, and as I bounce around again in my head, uh, to go, I want to go flashback while I can, while I got you. Uh, when I had Rachel Bolin on, he told a, a funny story how he kind of bonded almost kind of with Izzy Stradlin, which was funny because he wasn't around much. Like he spoke to Rachel more than they, than Izzy spoke to the, his actual bandmates, the entire That's tour. True. That's true. But if you will cause I just, I'm just asking, I'm not like a, you know, a, a, a tabloid or kind of dirt situation, but that's just a funny story that came up. So do you have funny story, anything that comes to mind when you think about, you know, all those years ago touring with Guns N' Roses, anything that, that comes out? Well, I remember, I played on Duff's first solo record, um, Believe in Me. And that all came out of building a relationship with Duff that I still have to this day. Um, I actually managed him for a little while as well. And I, I adore him. 
Uh, I think he's one of the the sweetest, humblest, strongest people I've ever met. And at that particular time, um, he was working on this solo record after their shows were over. He'd go to a studio at like one o'clock in the morning. And I, we were getting friendly and stuff. And, and I don't know whether I said, hey, man, you know, I would love to be a part of it. And I probably what would happen. And, and he was like, absolutely. Come on down and, and, and play on it. I was like, this is great. And so after the shows, we would get in a car and, and go to a local studio, whether whatever city we were in. And we'd go in a studio and, and be there from like one in the morning to like six in the morning. And it was great. I had such a great time. I loved playing on his music and I loved being directed as far as what he was looking for. And, uh, but it was pretty crazy because, you know, we were all imbibing at that time as well. So there was a lot of drunkenness going on and, um, uh, you know, I, I, I did my best to keep up and, uh, <laughs> You know, much to much to the dismay of my liver, uh, I was able to I was able to hold my own. But uh, I had I have nothing but fond memories of that that whole time. And uh, you know, one of the interesting things of that tour was I, I remember when our records both had finally come out. Like ours had come out a couple months ahead of theirs uh use your illusion one and two and we i think we were in denver and rachel and i went out to a club uh slash and and his bodyguard and maybe a couple of the other guys were there but we were sitting at a table with slash and hanging out and uh there was a band there a cover band and they ended up playing uh Monkey Business. It was the first time we had ever heard any band play Monkey Business and it had only been out, you know, a month or two. And and I forget what Guns N' Roses song they played. Uh, oh, gosh. It might have been You Could Be Mine. I'm not sure. But it, it was probably something off the, off the Use Your Illusion record. But it was just really something to be a part of that moment and realize, like, yeah, you know, we had just had a number one record, and and they had number one records, and we were touring together. And it was just a great hard rock tour, uh, and uh, I wish we could have done more shows, uh, because I think from an audience perspective, uh, it was really, I think people really got their money's worth. I think both. Both bands were were firing on all cylinders, um, and 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 don't get me wrong. I mean, there were some nights that I would have a rough night, or or you know, the band might not be uh, up to snuff, but the excitement of it was still there. The that vibe that something special was happening was there. That's. Uh... I appreciate that's why I asked these stories because I was too young then. I was into the Muppet Babies, early Michael Jackson. I mean, it wasn't like I, I was born in 83. Sorry, just to, so you have a, a basis uh, to understand it. But sure. I love hearing about that because that's like the, the that tour, the Use Your Illusion tour. It's like nothing like that will ever happen again. And it's just to be a part of it. Anyone who I feel like is a part of it, and, and that's just a part of it, not even including your own history with Skid Row. It's just like, wow. To be a part of that, we just didn't know what was going to happen every night. And if it no. and if things went well, you were going to have probably the best rock show ever that you've ever seen. You know, yeah, but as, then you have a moment like St. Louis, and it's like, oh my gosh, you know, when the riot occurred. Uh, and it's so weird because I had a bad feeling that afternoon. Like, we were only the second show that was in that venue. And... I was talking to this 18 year old kid and I'm like, well, you know, what do you, what do you do here? And, and she was like, oh, I'm part of security. I'm like, how old are you? She says 18. I'm like, oh boy. Like, 
the first show I think they had there was Jimmy Buffett. I'm like, this is a far cry from that. And my God, I hope you don't get hurt in any way because this could get really crazy. And it got obviously much, much, much more crazy than I could have ever imagined. I never thought there would be a riot and didn't even realize to the degree of what was going on until we got to Chicago, I believe it was. And Rachel and I got to our hotel room. We put on CNN, just we put on a TV and it happened to be on CNN. And we're seeing this going on. And I'm like, Rach, come check this out. This is wild. And didn't know what it was. And then all of a sudden, it's like Guns N' Roses. And we're like, oh, my God. I go, that's us. That's our show. And uh, it was far beyond what I, tragic, uh, what I, what I thought uh, it would have turned into. And I'm just thankful that no one died. Um, Because it was. I mean, I learned more about it watching it on TV than I did by being there because as soon as things started to go a little bit haywire, we got out of there. And it was Izzy's uh, bus driver, I believe it was, or Izzy's security guy or both that said, things are starting to get out of hand. Let's get out of here. Follow us out of here. So we followed his bus out of the venue mm. uh, and made our way to the next city and unfortunately had to cancel some shows because so much equipment. PA and backline got right. got ruined, and so we had a, uh, you know, you got to get new equipment for for you know PA and and some of their amplifiers and things like that. And that took a, that, that took about I don't know maybe five days or something like that to get all that replaced, uh, and then we were back on a road. But it was talk about an experience and and you know like i said you, you don't know what's going on until you see it on the news it's like really the days before this the phones oh like, yeah yeah yeah. it's just yeah. like where everything is instant twitter you know people are making news with lives and um former guns N' roses manager doug goldstein he's told me that they were referred to as the cnn band uh <laughs> guns N' roses so that kind of verifies that the cnn band uh, doug is, is an old dear friend of mine i love him yeah, no, we're we're friends as well. He's a he's an interesting character. He's a good guy. Yeah, um, man. Yeah, right on, uh, right on. So I could talk to you for for hours. I appreciate uh, those stories. But to kind of wrap things up, is it anything with the the gangs all here? Are you already thinking about new music, or are you just because we're all digesting this, or is it just like gangs all here touring all of next year and and just have fun? Usually, well, it's kind of all those things. Uh, Eric has brought like another creative voice to the band. Uh, he's obviously he's an amazing singer and he's an amazing person. Uh, he's got such a great outlook on stuff and, and on life. And uh, He's very creative. So he's a really good guitar player. He's a really good piano player uh, and he writes. And so we've already put together, I don't know, like three or four things so far uh for the next record and we usually don't work writing songs we've never been really good at writing songs on the road but maybe this time around with eric being in full maybe it'll be different uh we certainly come up with a lot of ideas and uh and you know record them on our phone at sound check and stuff like that and then go revisit them and make sure that you know it's as good as we thought it was then and and it doesn't happen every time, but a lot of times it does where, where the, the idea is a really strong idea. And so uh, we've got a bunch of that stuff together as well. And we're going to do it with Nick again, just because the process was so phenomenal. Even if we didn't get the response to the record that we've gotten, which is, I mean, we're also thankful for, for how it's been received. Um, we would still want to work with him again because the process was so uh energizing and, and inspiring and and uh as a creative person and as a songwriter it was really uh it was challenging in the most unbelievably positive way uh you know he, he not only challenged you as a as a guitar player and a musician but as a performer as a songwriter and as a person you know what are you made of you know, or can you rise to the challenge? And whenever he challenged you, 
He did it in such a way that you really wanted to succeed. You wanted to meet that challenge. You never did it in a condescending way. He did it in a way where he's like, I know you've got something inside of you that's going to blow what you just played away. I know you do. Now find it. It's like, yeah, you're right. I do. And just instill this sense of uh, confidence that you might not have had five minutes ago. And that's really, really special that a person's able to do that and have such a profound effect on, on everybody as a whole and, and, and individually. That's really what the kind of person you want to work with. Yeah. I mean, you, you can uh, try to convey that message, but really poorly. And yeah, it, but it's, I'm, sure, I'm sure you you know that like you've, yeah. you've experienced those people that you know eh, it's not that good. Do it again. That's not the same. Th it's the message may be the same, other than you could find it in you. Come on, let's let's go. You know, it's yeah, compl completely completely different. Uh, and before I I forget because I asked Rachel this, I know you weren't in the skit in SNL 1991. I know complete left turn. Uh, but did you have any fond memories? I guess of of because that's to me. That and Faith No More. You guys had the best two performances I, I growing up. Your hair in sync, all of it. When you were headbanging, all like yeah. all of you guys, I, I still remember it to this day. So I'm just it curious. was so awesome, man. I remember when we got the word that we were actually going to be on Saturday Night Live. I mean, I had been watching it since it, it first came on. I watched it as a young kid. I remember that first year with Chevy Chase and John Belushi. I remember that. And so I had been a fan and still am, actually, to be quite honest. I still am a fan. Uh, and then, you know, very envious of all the other bands that got to play on there. And, and then uh, when the opportunity arose, I remember we were really united and, uh, and focused that we weren't going to let this opportunity slip by. And we were going to change a lot of people's perceptions about who we were as a band. Uh, we were going to go out there and we were going to crush it, man. Uh, there was no doubt about that. Like we were, we were focused and we were, we were in line with one another uh, for the same sole purpose of just destroying. And so once we started. I mean, there's a lot of nerves. Don't get me wrong. Like, there's a small audience there. But yeah. in the back of your mind, you know there's another 8 million people watching or however many people. And you're in the midst of this hallowed ground uh, that has so many legendary performances on it. You're sharing that stage with, you know, decades worth of amazing, iconic performances. And so it was our uh, our responsibility to really bring it, and we did. Um, I felt there was no second guessing it. I I knew when we were done with Monkey Business that we had really really crushed it, and uh, not to pat ourselves on the back or be egotistical. I just I felt that in my soul. I was like, well, you know what? We just did really good. Like we did really good. We we did what we came here to do. But when the next song we played, "Piece of Me." I mean, Scotty's gear wasn't working. Oh, yeah. And it wasn't working. And it wasn't working. They're going, okay, in five huh. or, and I'm going, oh, no. And he goes, and two. And all of a sudden, Scotty's rig came on. And we're like, holy crap. Huh. So that just, that added to the stress of the whole thing. But uh, I've, I've seen the performance a few times after that. And, uh, you know, I'm so I'm so thankful that people still have high regard for it. You know, I remember a few years back, the comedian Bill Burr sure. posted something about it, and I, it's just really, really cool that after all this time, you still get recognized for uh, a moment in your history um, that you did a good thing. And I'm being honest. I grew up. I, I was, and I'm still. I'm not as much as a fan as I was growing up. I was the Mike Myers, Dana Carvey era, the era that you were on. Yeah. Especially when it was on repeats on Comedy Central all the time. Yeah. There are very few. So I've seen a lot of acts and very few stick with me. I think about that. Every time Monkey Business comes up on my playlist, I just think about all you guys, like your hairs are just windmills. And yeah. it stuck with me. Like, and I mentioned with like Faith No More with Mike Patton climbing up into the, the fans. So oh, it was awesome. All these years later, those uh those stick with me. I hope we get to do this again, but just in case I had to ask you uh 
you know, of that now, just in case. Of yeah, that. no, thank you so much, man. It's been a absolute pleasure speaking with you and, and I hope you have an amazing holiday, man. Good luck. Uh, congratulations on, you know, your, uh, your child coming into the world soon and, and your new marriage and everything. So, uh, I hope you have a great holiday, bud. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I think Hanukkah is Monday. I'm the worst Jew ever because I always have to have a Gentile. Like my wife tell me like, when's Hanukkah? She, I, I owe every year. I it just, right. I I'm, I'm terrible. I'm, I'm a Seinfeld to go back to a nineties reference. I'm that kind of, you know, Jewish. Yeah, person, I, I get it. I totally get it. So I'm sure we'll see more tour updates and just go to skidroad.com and all the, uh, yeah, all the, the social media platforms, cool. the, all the usual suspects. And yeah, we're, uh, we're working on that second leg of the tour as we speak, actually. Awesome. Well, thank you again, Mr. Snake, Mr. Sabo. What do you prefer, by the way? David? Snake. Everybody calls me Snake, snake. including my wife oh, and kids. Oh. <laughs> All right. Well, my wife calls me Brando. So maybe uh, that, that isn't bad. Okay. Yeah. Fair enough. Fair enough. That's cool. Well, uh, thank you so much, Snake. And uh, as far as the next episode of Appetite for Distortion is concerned, I'll just tell people I'm going to do a, speaking of Australia, I guess. I'm going to do an Australian review with a bunch of Aussie fans that listen to this podcast and talking about what happened in uh, Australia and, and Axel, you know, tossing a mic and hitting a woman and drones See. and all this crap. Uh, that's another episode. So never a dull uh, moment. Never a dull moment. So stay tuned for that. When will you see it? In the words of Axel Rose concerning Chinese democracy, I don't know if soon is the word, but you'll see it. <laughs>